Hello, everyone. This is the first of four videos that will cover the use of an open exam. So today I'm probably going to do questions one through 12, maybe one through 13. And then throughout the next couple of days, I'll post videos um, for the rest of the questions. So within this, these four days, we will get through all of the questions in the 2017 use of an open. Um, I'll also be posting some videos related to like campbell biology and like the actual information on the exam that you need to learn to succeed so be on the lookout for that but for right now let's start with the first 12 or 13 questions on the 2017 open all right question one so we have a virus has been discovered the virus has no envelope and consists of a helical capsid surrounding its ds dna genome during assembly, the pack site of the genome ensures that it is properly packaged by capsomeres. Which of the following amino acids is slash are expected to be on the capsomere domain that interact with the pack site? All right. And then we have five options. Well, okay. One thing with a lot of usable questions is that most of it is not extremely essential information. So right here... The most essential information seems to be that the fact that DNA is negatively charged. So if DNA is negatively charged, we want amino acids that are positively charged because positive and negative attract. All right. So I know lysine is positive. Methionine is neutral. Um, glycine is negative. Arginine is positive. So... That means E would be the answer because we want the ones that are positively charged. So this kind of accentuates the fact that you need to know your amino acids, their hydrophobicity, their charge, their acidity, all, acidity, all that stuff, because that was really essential for this question. So that's why the answer is E, because lysine and arginine are both positively charged and they would attract and interact with the negatively charged DNA. All right, next question. So let me erase that here. Question number two. So here we have developing diagnostics for the Zika virus has proven to be difficult due to cross-reactivity displayed by antibodies for other flaviviruses. If a person has been previously exposed to certain flaviviruses, then he or she may have antibodies which diagnostics erroneously attribute to Zika virus composure. Exposure. Um, the Issue stems from antibodies that resulted from a prior immune response in, a, in the classic immune response, which cells are responsible for the production of antibodies. All right. So right now, realistically speaking, all of the information right here, and I'm just boxing it in the blue, this is kind of unimportant. Like, it's giving us good facts, but we really don't need to know that know this to answer the question because we have in the the real question is in the classic immune response which cells produce antibodies now if i would be responding to someone like like talking to someone maybe like just my teacher my first response would just be b cells but this question wants us to be a little bit more specific so let's just go through each of the answers macrophages and eos um eosinophils are completely different. They don't produce antibodies. They are responsible. They're white blood cells that are responsible, um, like that have a role in the immune response. But like macrophages, you can tell they're big, and so that's what macro means. And phag, like phagocytosis, they kind of eat cells. And eosinophils, um, they also have like a role in killing parasites, and like the bad, um, intruders. So. They are essential in the immune system, but they don't produce antibodies. So I'll just cross both of those out. Um, plasma cells right now seems to be the best answer because I'm pretty sure that they're the ones that create the antibodies. But otherwise, option D, um, T lymphocytes. T lymphocytes are essential, but we have cytotoxic T cells, which don't produce antibodies. And we have helper T cells, which are essential in the immune system, but they don't produce antibodies. That is specifically for B cells, not T cells. And then goblet cells. So 
I don't even think these are mentioned in Campbell. So I think this is just an option that they threw in there just to throw you off. But I believe goblet cells are like the mucus lining, but they're not in antibodies. So plasma cells seems to be the best answer and seems to be the correct answer. Okay, so let's go to the next question. Question number three. The structure shown in is an example of, an, and then select the best, best answer. We have carbohydrate, lipid, nucleic acid, um, saturated lipid, or unsaturated lipid, lipid. Okay. So first of all, I can tell straight off the bat, this is not going to be a nucleic acid. Because nucleic acids, for example, like DNA, they have phosphorus, and this one does not. So no phosphorus no nucleic acid. This is not a carbohydrate. And the reason being is because carbohydrates don't have the tendency to form long chains. That's something that lipids do. So I can cross out carbohydrates. And also option B, because it's saying it like wants us to select the best answer. So that means it's going to be some type of like specific type of lipid. So it's either a saturated or unsaturated um, type of lipid. Okay, so now it's important to know the difference between the two. So a saturated lipid or saturated fat is um, a fat where you only have single bonds. So you're saturated with the hydrogen bonds. An unsaturated fat, you would have double or triple bonds, which is present in this scenario. We have one here, 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 here. They're all over the place. So this why, that's why this would be unsaturated because of those double bonds. So the answer to number three would be E. All right, let's go to the next question. So question number four. Okay. You are analyzing a type of receptor that is based, that is expressed on the cell surface of two different cell types, cell type one and cell type two. Based on the given, in, based on the information given in the table below, identify the cell type whose receptor is more sensitive to the ligand. We're given cell type one and cell type two. And we're given their K1. And then it gives the option choices. Okay. So I know for a fact, I'm not really sure what K1 is. But I know for a fact that if KD is smaller, that means that the cell is more sensitive. So I think the answer would be i'm not yeah i think the answer would be d cell type 2 is more sensitive because um we have a higher k1 and that would lead to a smaller kd and kd is the dissociation constant for those who are wondering so i know for a fact that if the kd is smaller than you hold on like it dissociates less so it would be more sensitive so that's why I think the answer would be D. But if someone has like a better explanation, I'm actually really not sure. This one, I just kind of use like an educated guess. Otherwise, I'm not really sure of this answer. But I think it is D. Um, Yeah, I'm not 100% sure about this one, though. Whoops, Let's, let me just erase that. All right, question five. We have... You are observing the response of type 1 and type 2 cells to a specific protein ligand. Type 1 cells proliferate rapidly in response to the ligand, unlike cell type 2. So which explains the difference? So option A, we have the gene encoding the ligand specific receptor is a methyl has a methylated promoter. Well, generally speaking, if something is methylated, that kind of silences it. So like... Um, I think in Campbell biology towards chapters 18, 19, 20, somewhere around there, I think the chapter is 18 or 19, depending on what edition you have. Methylation is, some, is something that silences um, a gene. So meth methylating type 1 cells would be incorrect because they pro proliferate a lot more faster than type 2 cells. All right, so type 1 cells express int intracellular receptors unlike type 2 cells? Well, if type 1 cells have intracellular receptors, 
they would actually pro proliferate much more slower because it would take time for everything to get like get to the nucleus you know make the response and then go further so just to be clear in the intracellular receptor and we have the nucleus here this is the nucleus i've just colored that in blue and then we have like a receptor it would have to go all the way into the nucleus and that's much more slower but plasma receptors like would be faster because you know plasma receptors they are on the plasma membrane. So that's why the answer would be C, because going just to the plasma membrane is much more quicker than actually going inside the cell. That's why I believe the answer would be um, C. And the next one talks about like transcription factors and mutations, but I don't think that's really necessary for this type of question. Okay. The next question says, which is question number six right here, Moxidin. The following reactions are free energy changes associated with four biological reactions. Which reaction will have the highest ratio of products to reactants at equilibrium? And then we're given the delta G for like the Gibbs free energy. All right, so highest pro ratio of products to reactants. So this is going to be a reaction where you're making, or like, yeah, you're really just like making something. Like the reactants would combine to make a product. So this would be um an anabolic reaction. And anabolic reactions are generally exergonic. So they're usually release reactions. So what I mean is that we have product A, and then we have product B, and then together they would make A, B. As you can see here. So that's how they would have a high product um, to reaction ratio. And since these are normally exergonic reactions, that means we would have a negative Gibbs free energy. Um, and the most negative out of all of these is option choice is option A. So that's why this would be A. So notice how option B, yes, it's still an exergonic reaction, but because it's it releases less energy than um, option A, that would not be the correct answer. Okay. Let's go to question number seven. Which of the following is a plausible reason that explains why extreme halophiles can tolerate high salt conditions? So we have that we have what they can accumulate compatible solutes such as glycerol and sucrose. They can prevent the entrance of protons. They have less porins of transport proteins. They have more saturated fatty acids, and they have more unsaturated fatty acids than um, saturated um, fatty acids. So. I think usually the answer would be compatible sol um, solutes because really if you have, if you're a halophile and high salt conditions, um, you don't want to have too much water that like, you know, goes out of you. So they would have these compatible solutes such as sucrose and glycerol so that they can kind of be similar to like the salt environment so that they don't have too much um, osmosis out of them. So I can just kind of draw this out here. When in a salt environment, there's a lot of, there's no water. Sorry, this is taking some time to write. So there's no water, but the cell inside will have like a reasonable amount of water. So the water would want to go out. But if you have those solutes, the water won't want to go out because you can create like, you know, a kind of an equilibrium. So we could have two, two on each side and that would kind of create an equilibrium. So you wouldn't like lice up. So that's why the answer is A. 
All right, question number eight. All right, this is a pretty long question. So usually the end, the qu actual question lies within the last um like sentence, but it's good to always read through the entire question because that might contain essential information. So we have NADPH oxidase is a complex of five proteins that forms, not hydrolyzes, reactive oxygen species such as O2 minus and H2O2 by catalyzing the reduction of oxygen by hydride ions from NADPH. Loss of function mutations um, were found. Okay, that causes CGD and CGD um, is characterized by the inability of neutrophils to destroy phagocyte cytosized bacteria, especially if the bacteria are capable of hydrolyzing H2O2. So that's per, um, hydrogen peroxide. And then you need to see which compartment of or subcellular organelle is has the most NADPH oxidase. All right. So my first instinct when I saw H, like hydrogen peroxide, H2O2, was to think of the peroxisome because that is generally... Like the first thing that you think with H2O2 is the peroxidum. It's even in the name. Perox is a little is like short for peroxide. But it is essential to realize that NADPH oxidase does not hydrolyze. And because it's a complex of five proteins that form reactive oxygen species, they don't hydrolyze. And because it doesn't hydrolyze, um, what is it called, H2O2, it formed it, the answer would not be peroxisomes. In fact, the answer would be lysosomes because lysosome contained a lot of these enzymes that do such functions. So it's really an essential to read this. If you hadn't read this hydrolyzing part, you would have gotten this question wrong. But so it's important to read the question thoroughly, just you know, skim over it, even though it might look like unimportant information, just like skim over it just to see what it's trying to talk about. So that's why the answer to this question would be um, B, lysosome. Question number nine. Which statement about the life cycle of HIV is most accurate? Um, so the viral glycoproteins that coat the mature virion's lipid envelopes outer surface are synthesized by host cell ribosomes in the cytosol. And then we just continue down there. The options choices are actually quite long. Um, so to me, some answers that really popped out were D and E. So the high error rate of reverse transcriptase enables the virus to invade the host circulating antibodies by changing the antigenicity of its internal capsid protein. So the reason this one kind of popped out to me was it's a very common like idea that viruses, um, like mutate, like, you know, the flu and mutates very quickly so that it can go um past the body's defenses and infect our body but in this case i actually think the answer would be d um because i believe this was actually explicitly mentioned in campbell biology's immune system chapter that the hiv provirus is unlatent so it does not really infect this is like a very known fact about hiv that it can stay dormant for a quite a long time and it's saying years after the initial infection, and then it can, um, you know, attack when it's necessary. So that's why I would say the option choice is D. Even though E seems correct, I'm 100% sure about D because this was explicitly mentioned in the book. Though E does seem, might seem correct. I, I believe it is not correct. Whoops. So question number 10. The progression of cancer is often driven by genetic and epigenetic alter alterations. Which of the following is not likely to contribute to tumor genesis? And we have these answers. Okay. So the loss of function of the mutation in P53 genes. All right. So if we have P53, that is a tumor suppressor gene. And if we have a loss of... um. Or P I think yeah, P53 is something that stops the cell cycle. That's why it's like a tumor suppressor. So if it lost 
loses function, then tumor genesis will occur because that's um that's kind of its function. It wants to reduce um tumor genesis. One important thing to understand is that there are some genes that promote the cell cycle, like RAS. So if we had a loss in function in RAS, that would be the correct answer. But P53 is important to know that that is a gene that suppresses cell cycle. All right. B is the upregulation of pro-apoptotic -ap proteins. All right, so if it's pro-apoptotic, that means it's going to, going to stimulate apoptosis. And apoptosis is the reaction in which the cell, like programmed cell death occurs. So if we have cell death, that means tumors will not form, the cells are dying. So that's why the answer would be B, because if the cells are dying, then um, apop and then tumor genesis will not happen. So that's why the answer would be B. And we have, we have C, D, and E, but they don't even make sense to this um, answer. So it is B. All right. Question 11. We have to compare C3 and C4 plants. So this is very, like mentioned quite a lot in the chapter, I think nine, or in the plant chapter, I think chapters nine or 11, depends what um version you have. Um. So as I read through the answers, okay, so PPAs, Rubisco, yes, so Rubisco is correct. Rubisco does perform the initial carbon fixation step in C3 plants. Yes, they lose a lot of water and energy through photorespiration. Um, let's see. Okay, so this one, the answer seems to be E. And the way I caught that was this word, temporal separation. Temporal means time. And the temporal separation does not occur with C4 plants. That occurs with CAM plants, CAM plants. So I'm 100% sure that this option is, that this thing about C4 plants is incorrect. So that's why the answer would be E because of that that temporal separation. But this is a kind of a good gr graph to kind of analyze so that you can kind of know the differences between C3 and C4 plants. All right, question um, 12. We have... Grace is attempting to identify what organism a tissue sample came from. She finds linear cellulose synthesi synthesizing complexes. Which of the following organisms could it have come from? And then we have plants, carophycian, and, or carophycian. I don't, I'm not sure how to pronounce it. And then we have green algae. So cellulose synthesizing complexes, or C CSCs, are generally um, circular. They're not linear. So my hypothesis is that it's only linear because we're looking at plants that were, or we're looking at plant-like organisms that came before plants. So maybe like circular C cellulose synthesizing complexes came like quite later in the evolutionary um, um, chain. So that's why because care, because option like two and option three are both like primitive versions of plants, I would say the answer is E. Okay. Next question. I think this would be the last one for today, where we do question number 13. Which of the following statements about vascular plant anatomy is false? Okay, so I'm not looking what's true. We're looking at what is false. Um... The bark is a coat of waxy suberin produced by the epidermis of woody plants. So right off the bat, I know that this is the answer. And here's why. Because the bark refers to like, you know, stuff outside of the like outer bark. That's referring to the stuff outside of the outer tor outer side of the vascular tissue. And I don't think it is produced by the epidermis. The periderm and the epidermis are kind of the two organelles that are in kind of that compose up the bark and it is produced by cam cambium, not the epidermis. So that's why the answer would be A. 
but we can look through the rest of the answers. So yes, trichomes are hair-like organisms, or sorry, hair-like um, structures on plants. Um, and the rest seems correct. One option that they might have you think twice is option C. So notice that xylem and phloem, some people can confuse them a little bit with the structure. Sieve tube elements and companion cells are with phloem. On the other hand, we have tracheids and vessel elements that are related with phloem. I mean, sorry, xylem. So don't confuse it with that. And mo these cells are dead, not alive. So that's why it wouldn't be C. D, plant stems arise from apical meristem produced by nodes and which are separated by internodes. That is correct. Because if you see here, if I have like a plant, you know, this would kind of... We have the nodes right here. Um, oh, wait, that was a little unclear. Let me just make that again. So let's say this is a plant. This right here is a node. These are internodes, like between the right here. These are internodes between the different nodes. And then in flowering plants, the xylem and the phloem form a vascular cylinder that runs down the center of the root. Yes, that is, of course, true. So therefore, the answer would be A. Okay, so I hope you guys enjoyed that video. Um, please make sure to subscribe for more content. I will be posting um, probably questions 14 to 25 tomorrow and probably some more information about the actual textbook and how to study for the use of our open. So be on the lookout for that. But other than that, see you guys next time.